bit about the Brain Foundation for those of you who are new or who don't know much about us. Um, our primary goal at the Brain Foundation is to fund high quality Australian research into brain diseases, disorders and injuries with the ultimate goal of improving patient outcomes. Um, secondly, we provide medically reviewed resources about brain conditions that anyone can learn to, that anyone can use to learn more about a particular disorder. Um, so this includes the articles on our website and also resources like this webinar um, and the other content that we've been sharing throughout Brain Awareness Week. Um, and lastly, we raise awareness about the impact of brain diseases and advocate for patients. So just to make sure everyone's in the right place tonight, who is this webinar for? This is for anyone who is interested in improving their brain health. Um, if you would like to learn more about cerebrovascular diseases such as stroke or aneurysm. And thirdly, if you want to ask a brain researcher about the link between health, lifestyle and cerebrovascular disease. Um, and to submit questions tonight, you can send them in the chat, which everyone's already using and then there's also the Q&A function um, which you should also see in the bottom part of the webinar um, and you can set send your questions directly to the panelists to make sure that we don't um, miss them. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker Dr Mathilde Balby. Dr Balby is a neuroscientist within the Queensland Brain Institute at the University of Queensland. And she leads a lab which aims to make an impact on the field of stroke recovery and other diseases by using a combination of imaging techniques, brain stimulation and individually tailored recovery models. Um, and she actually received a Brain Foundation research grant last year to investigate a debilitating complication of aneurysm rupture, which occurs in about a quarter of patients. So we're really looking forward to learning more through her research and are um, really excited that she can be here to speak to us tonight. So without further ado, let's start the presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before starting, uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners and the custodianship of the land on which we meet today. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to, to the country. I'd like to recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and the global society. Hello and uh, welcome to this webinar on cerebrovascular health as part of the 2024 Brain Awareness Week. My name is Matilde Balbi and uh, I am a group leader at the Queensland Brain Institute at the University of Queensland in, uh, in Brisbane. Uh, today uh, we are going to talk about cerebrovascular health, uh, what it means and what are the key components of cerebrovascular health. Uh, I'm going to talk about factors influencing cerebrovascular health, and uh, uh, I'm going to give you some examples of cerebrovascular diseases, specifically uh, on stroke, which is uh, what we study in, uh, in, in my lab. In the last part of the talk, uh, I'm going to quickly talk about my research on cerebrovascular health, and uh, I will finish off with a few basic tips for uh, promoting uh, cerebrovascular health. So let's start with uh, uh, what is a cerebrovascular health. Well, cerebrovascular health refers to the overall well-being and functioning of the blood vessels that supply the, the brain with oxygen and nutrients. The, the term cerebrovascular specifically uh, refers to the blood vessels in the brain, including arteries and veins. Uh, maintaining a good cerebrovascular health is essential for optimal brain functioning and for preventing uh, neurological disorders. But uh, why? Why is it so uh, crucial? Well, first of all, because the, the brain has a very high uh, basal uh, metabolic demand. It uses uh, up to 20% of the body uh, energy in terms of uh, oxygen uh, consumption, while accounting for only 2% of the total body mass. Uh, however, uh, the brain can store a very uh, limited um, 
amounts of energy uh, substrates, which, which makes the brain a very hungry organ. And to satisfy uh, this hunger, the brain requires a continuous delivery of glucose and uh, oxygen uh, throughout the, the, the bloodstream. Uh, therefore, the brain needs a very tight regulation of cerebral blood flow. As any, uh, any imbalance between metabolism and blood flow um, weakly uh, affects brain function. The, to, to irrigate the, the, the brain, uh, blood is delivered throughout the cerebral vasculature. From the brain surface, uh, arteries and veins are generally um, defined as pile arteries or pile veins. And then as they descend uh, into the brain, they get smaller and they change their cellular composition. So penetrating arteries will be characterized by a thicker layer of endothelium cells, for example, compared to uh, parenchymal arteries, which are deeper uh, into, the, into the brain. Uh, capillaries are the deeper, you see them here, are um, the, the smaller and deeper part of the, of the vascular uh, tree. So the intricate relationship uh, between brain activity and the blood flow uh, regulation involves many cell types. Um, these cell types form what is called the neurovascular unit. We, we, we typically uh, hear about the, the neurons, which are the cell types we all uh, concentrate the most when we think about diseases. But uh, there are lots of other cells that play a key role in maintaining brain's function. Uh, and that includes um, uh, like supporting cells, uh, such as uh, astrocytes, uh, which have many, many functions in the brain, including uh, a role in waste clearance from the brain. Uh, microglia are, an, are another example. Uh, they are the brain's resident immune cells, and they also play an important um, role in keeping the brain healthy. So as you can see in this uh, schematic right here, the, the cells that form the neurovascular unit are all either directly or indirectly contacting each other, and they are contacting brain vasculatures. So this um, communication and this interaction between cell types is essential uh, for a, a physiological neurovascular coupling. Now, the neurovascular coupling is a crucial uh, mechanism that is needed to match the high energy demand of the brain with a supply in energy substrates from the bloodstream. And all the signaling uh, within cells in the neurovascular unit is responsible for activity-dependent changes in the cerebral blood flow. So to an increase uh, in brain activity, uh, it needs to correspond an increase in uh, blood supply. And this process needs to be finely uh, tuned. Key factors that contribute to cerebrovascular health uh, can be classified as modifiable um, and non-modifiable risk factors. Modifiable risk factors, um, I want you to think about them as something that you can control. Uh, and those include high blood pressure or hypertension, uh, which can uh, damage the, the, the arteries. So uh, over time, high blood pressure can weaken and narrow uh, blood vessels and increase the risk of stroke or other cerebrovascular events. So managing uh, hypertension through uh, lifestyle changes, such as uh, maintaining a healthy diet, uh, regular exercise, and stress reduction uh, may significantly reduce the, the risk of cerebrovascular diseases. So regular monitoring and control of blood pressure levels are 
essential for the for overall um, cerebrovascular health. High levels of cholesterol, particularly low density lipoprotein cholesterol, uh, can uh, contribute to the formation of plaques in the, in the blood vessels, leading to atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis can restrict blood flow and can increase the, the risk of, of, of stroke. Uh, also, in these cases, uh, managing the cholesterol levels through lifestyle changes, such as uh, adopting a healthy diet, which is low in the saturated and trans fats, uh, regular exercise, weight management, can significantly help reduce the risk of cerebrovascular diseases. Chronic uh, elevated uh, blood sugar levels, as seen in uh, conditions such as diabetes, uh, can damage the walls of our blood vessels, and that's throughout the entire body, including vessels in the brain. We can manage uh, diabetes through lifestyle. Uh, we can maintain a healthy diet, regular exercise, and uh, blood uh, sugar monitoring. This can be accompanied um, with medications, and this is essential for reducing the risk of cerebrovascular diseases. Um, additionally, um, it's, it's important to control for other risk factors associated with, uh, with diabetes, such as high blood pressure and high cholesterol levels, and that's very, very important. Um, I, I mentioned already um, more than once the importance of a, um, of a healthy uh, lifestyle. So um, choosing um, and managing uh, lifestyle factors such as regular physical activity, a balanced uh, diet, uh, maintaining uh, healthy, a healthy weight and avoiding smoking, drinking, significantly contributes to cerebrovascular health. Non-modifiable uh, risk factors for uh, cerebrovascular diseases are those factors that cannot be changed or uh, controlled. Um, and these include age, um, so the, the, the risk of cerebrovascular diseases increases with, uh, with age, uh, with older adults being at a higher uh, risk. Uh, these age-related increases uh, in, in risk is mainly attributed to uh, factors such as the cumulative effects of chronic conditions, um, decreased elasticity of blood vessels, and uh, age-related changes in, in brain vasculatures. Sex is also a, a factor. Uh, men have a higher uh, risk of stroke compared to women, although women's risk uh, increases after menopause. Having a family history of stroke or cerebrovascular diseases also increase, uh, increase the, the one's risk. Ethnicity. Uh, certain ethnic groups such as African-Americans, Hispanics, and Native Americans are higher risk of stroke compared to others. And several factors can contribute to these disparities, including differences in, uh, differences in the uh, prevalence of traditional stroke risk uh, factors such as hypertension, diabetes, and uh, uh, obesity among certain ethnic groups. Uh, for example, African-Americans have a higher rate of hypertension and diabetes compared to uh, Caucasians, which contributes to their increased risk of, of stroke. Um, additionally, uh, this is something to consider, um, Socioeconomic uh, factors, access to healthcare, and um, cultural influences may also play a role in uh, in, in stroke risk disparities uh, among uh, ethnic different ethnic groups. 
um, there is another component that uh, I need to mention, that's genetic factors, which may also contribute to differences in risk among different uh, ethnic uh, groups. Now, while these uh, risk factors cannot be changed, uh, it is important for individuals to be aware of that and to focus on the modifiable risk factors to reduce the overall uh, risk. Now, let's, um, let's switch a bit gears and uh, let's uh, look at numbers. Um, when we uh, look at the top five uh, causes of death, uh, death in, uh, in Australia, um, we see ischemic heart diseases being right on top, um, and that's a condition where the where uh, the blood flow to the to the heart is reduced to the narrowing of the of coronary arteries. Um, dementia and Alzheimer's disease um, is is a condition characterized by progressive cognitive decline and memory loss. Uh, and then uh, cerebrovascular diseases are the third leading cause of death uh, in Australia. Uh, and that's followed by lung cancer and uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, a condition affecting the, the, the lungs. Now, when we specifically uh, look at the numbers for stroke, we can see that one, uh, in, I mean, stroke is one of the main uh, examples of cerebrovascular conditions, conditions. So every 19 minutes, an Australian will suffer a stroke. And more than 40,000 Australians are already living with the, with the effects of a stroke. Um, regional Australians are 17% more likely to, so to suffer a stroke. But why? What's happening? What causes a stroke and what are their effects? So um, a stroke uh, occurs when uh, an artery leading to the brain or within the brain is blocked or damaged. And this leads to brain uh, damage. And that damage is specific to the, to the function of that part of the brain. Now, Blood flow can be interrupted either by a blood clot, and in this case, we speak of an ischemic stroke, or a burst vessels that leads to a hemorrhagic uh, stroke. Following stroke, we can distinguish between a stroke core, which is uh, an area where the damage is irreversible. And within the core, cell death occurs very fast. The area that surrounds the ischemic stroke is instead called penumbra. And the, the penumbra is considered um, at risk uh, area because over the course of the, the days following stroke, there is an increased, uh, there is an increased likelihood that cell death will occur. However, uh, this process may be reversed, uh, maybe if the cell that may be interrupted if blood flow is promptly restored, and this area may still be rescued. So this is the target area for intervention, and I will get back to that when, I, uh, when I'm going to tell you a bit more about the research that we do in my lab. So the, the effects of a stroke can vary widely depending on factors such as the, the type of stroke, uh, the area of the brain affected, and the severity of the, of the injury. Um, stroke can cause weakness or paralysis on uh, one side of the body, and that's known as uh, hemiparesis, um, and this can affect mobility, balance, and uh, coordination. Stroke can impair the ability to, to speak, uh, understand language, or uh, produce coherent speech, a uh, condition that is known as aphasia. 
and uh, it can also affect reading and writing uh, uh, abilities. Stroke can lead to cognitive deficits, such as difficulties with memory, uh, attention, uh, problem solving and reasoning. And some um, individuals may even experience changes in personality or uh, behavior. Um, stroke can cause sensory deficit, such as numbness, uh, tingling, uh, or loss of sensation on one side of the body. And it can also affect vision, uh, resulting in visual field cuts or loss. Um, in some patients, the double vision or uh, visual perception problems. Stroke can impair the ability to, to um, swallow safely, uh, leading to uh, choking, uh, aspiration, or difficulties eating and uh, drinking. Stroke survivors may experience mood changes such as depression, anxiety, irritability, and emotional lability. And coping with the, with the physical and emotional challenges of a stroke can also lead to stress and uh, adjustment difficulties. So it's, 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 not, uh, it's not easy. Um, and many uh, stroke survivors also experience fatigue uh, which can significantly impact uh, daily daily functioning and quality of life overall. Um, stroke can affect uh, activities of uh, daily living, such as dressing, bathing, grooming, feeding. Um, it may also impact uh, participation in uh, social and recreational uh, activities. So overall. Uh, the effects of stroke can be profound and they may require long-term rehabilitation and support to basically maximize uh, recovery and quality of life. Now, um, rehabilitation strategies may include physical therapy, uh, occupational therapy, uh, speech therapy, cognitive therapy, and also um, psych psychological support. Now, Early, um, early intervention and ongoing care are a, cru a, a crucial step for uh, optimizing outcomes and promoting uh, independence and well-being for stroke survivors. And it is exactly on this acute time frame that myself and researchers in my lab focus our efforts. So now I'm quickly going to give you an idea of uh, what we work on in uh, in the lab and what is that we're doing to um, understand uh, how we can use um, rehabilitation. So um, in the lab, we use animal models to uh, measure things that we couldn't measure in human patients. We um, develop new strategies for uh, rehabilitation after stroke, such as direct brain stimulation. And we use cranial windows and advanced microscopy techniques to observe the responses of neurons and blood vessels in real time. Now, the type of brain stimulation that uh, I use focuses on uh, reactivating homeostatic mechanisms that play a role in maintaining uh, a healthy uh, equilibrium under normal conditions. And by uh, starting treatment as early as possible after stroke and uh, seizing controls for these mechanisms, we have now shown that we can mitigate some of the damage uh, and improve the, uh, the outcome. So um, using a specific type of brain stimulation at a specific frequency, we have uh, shown the neuroprotective effects of our intervention, and that uh, was in the acute phase after stroke. Um, what we actually show is that our stimulation improves uh, cerebral blood flow in the penumbra, which is our target uh, area. 
uh, it reduces the occurrence of spreading depolarizing waves, which is an event known uh, to occur after stroke that basically correlates with the with a worse outcome, and it finally uh, improves mode of performance. More uh, recently. Um, we, we have tried to understand the mechanism behind these neuroprotective effects that, that we saw. And um, we, we showed that our stimulation restores the ability of the brain to establish functional connections between, between the neurons that are in the same region, but also uh, neurons that are across different brain regions. Um, and this is a phenomenon called uh, functional synaptic plasticity. So I, I hope I have convinced you that by modulating brain activity, um, we the modulating brain activity may serve as a potential target for uh, neuroprotection against stroke. And having the possibility of exploring these mechanisms is essential to then translate these findings in, uh, in the human, uh, in human and in the clinical uh, setting. So I, I like to, um, to finish uh, this presentation with a few tips for maintaining a good neurovascular health. Um, that includes minimizing the lifestyle the risks, uh, risk factors that I, I, I mentioned before. So exercise regularly, eat a healthy and balanced diet, drink in moderation or abstain from drinking if you can, uh, and no smoking. Uh, from my own uh, research, uh, I would recommend always getting uh, a good sleep. Now, one of the most important functions uh, of sleep is to flush out some of the bioproducts of neuronal activity and replenish the extracellular fluid in the brain. Um, if you... If your starting point is already out of the balance, the outcome after stroke can be much worse. So sleep is actually neuroprotective before stroke and can make a huge difference uh, later on. Finally, um, stress is a big risk factor for high blood pressure. So do your best to improve your work-life balance. And meditation is also highly uh, recommended. So find um, meditation techniques that appeal to you. And last but not least, uh, socialize. Uh, humans are social animals and building strong connection is, uh, is, is fantastic for our neurological well-being. So spend time with friends and family uh, because even if they they keep you uh, they can at least call an ambulance when you need it and um, if you want to know more uh, about our research please reach out i'm always happy to talk more about what we do in the lab and for the moment, I thank you for the attention and I look forward to hearing your questions in the second part of the webinar. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that, Mathilde. Um, that was a really great uh, presentation. Um, I hope everyone uh, enjoyed that. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting into the questions. Um, I just had a couple of things that I wanted to um, ask first, just based on your presentation, because um, you mentioned um, that there were the two, type, two types of stroke, the, or the two, I guess, like areas of damage in stroke, the penumbra and the part that has the irreversible damage. Just for context, um, how do you identify, like, what, how much has been damaged? Do you have to, is that an MRI or do you need to do surgery or is there some other like tests or symptoms that you can measure? How do you tell what the extent of the damage is? 
So definitely one of the first things that you do when you get to the hospital is imaging, brain imaging that will be able to determine the location and the size of your uh, of your stroke of your damage. Um, we we like to define things when we in our research um, for a very important reason. Uh, and you you did mention that when uh, um, when you when you talked about the damage, the irreversible core, the dam damage in the core within the core, and the the penumbra which surrounds the the the, the, the strongly, heavily damaged area. And this is our target of intervention. We usually, with our intervention, target the, the, the penumbra because this is the region that we can still uh, rescue. So it's very, very important to immediately, uh, I mean, at least as soon as possible, determine how, where the stroke is and how much is damaged. Mm, yeah, of course. Um, and is there anything that predicts like where the damage happens in the brain? Um, is there anything connected or is it just random where the stroke occurs? Okay, yeah. So um, getting into some of these questions, um, we have one here from Pam. Um, you spoke about high blood pressure as a risk factor, but is there anything about low blood pressure and stroke? Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, it is a less common cause of, of a stroke but um, if you think that uh, low blood pressure is any way um, will any way determine less blood uh, to the brain uh, it can be associated with uh, with damage but it's definitely uh, a less common cause still harmful but less common than um, high blood pressure okay that makes sense, yeah. Um, and then we have an anonymous question here asking, um, after a CVA, is the, a CVA, is that another term for stroke? It's a cerebrovascular accident, I think, okay. asphalt. Uh, I think that's... Okay. Um, and so this person has asked, after a, a CVA, what are the recovery timeframes? Um, do you continue to see improvements? Is it just in that, like, that short acute phase that you spoke about or can you see improvements you know two three years afterwards so definitely um i mean recovery time is very different for everyone mm -hmm. um can I mean, some people can take weeks months years there is still um i mean Improvements can continue over time, even for years, but um, for many people, uh, it's the first uh, six months is where quickest improvement occurs. So you will see the difference in terms of improvements within the first six months, then, then it's everything slowed down a tiny bit, but Anyway, it's very different from person to person. That's why it's very important to continue therapy. Um, obviously, that depends on the where the stroke occurred, so the kind of therapy that you are going to be doing. Uh, but it's very, very important to continue therapy and to, to really have a positive attitude even towards, uh, towards that. Yeah, no, of course. It makes um... a huge difference. Mm. Yeah, um, that's that's good to know then. Um, and we have an, a question here from Carl asking, um, what are some potential activities that we can do to promote um, like the brain stimulation and the strengthening of connections? Um, you know, whether that's in general or in that like really important recovery phase. So, for example, uh, during the recovery phase, I would definitely follow what um, speech pathologists, the physiotherapists will recommend to do. Um, it, it really depends on the kind of brain region that has been affected. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that, I mean, we're speaking of the recovery phase, right? What you can do uh, before something 
that follows within what I've been discussing in the presentation, like lifestyle, uh, activity, um, uh, healthy diet. Uh, those are things that help the brain a lot. Sleep. Um, and I, in the last part of the presentation, I did mention something that is extremely interesting about the ability of the, the brain uh, to wash out uh, all uh, products of metabolism. And that helps a lot the brain to, to, to prevent neurodegeneration. Um, but in the face post-stroke, post -stroke, it really depends on the kind of therapy that uh, you will have to follow. Uh, and that's something that depends on the brain region affected. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Um, and um, in terms of the research that you're doing about the, um, the brain stimulation, um, what is, do you, do you know anything about like the time frame of the research outcomes? Like obviously it's a, it's a really exciting um, prospect being able to um, stimulate that kind of neuroplasticity and everything. Um, but what's kind of the time frame on when we might start to see clinical trials or um, like what stage of the research are we at currently? So right now we are conducting preclinical uh, studies. So we are still at the phase where we use animal models. Mm -hmm. And the, the research has shown a lot of promises when targeting the acute phase after stroke. Right now, next step would be to try to, um, to expand a tiny bit the window of intervention. So trying with our stimulation a tiny bit later on after the occurrence of a stroke, just because it's much more realistic that any sort of intervention will occur at a later stage after the occurrence of a stroke. So uh, once we uh, we add this other piece of the puzzle, I think that will put us in a very good position to try to then go for clinical trials. Uh, the kind of stimulations that we are trying are also, and we are trying to be very close to trans to something that is translatable. So we are trying sensory stimulations um, because that, that would be you know, easy to translate from my animal models to humans. So uh, we're not there yet, but we're getting very close. Yeah, that's really exciting. Um, I can't wait to learn more about that. Um, and we have, a, this is a slightly, I guess, a different topic. Um, and I'm not really sure what the response might be here, but we have a question here from Wendy, sorry, from Leanne. Um, asking how do you tell the difference between MS, um, stroke and dementia brain lesions. And there's also um, Ingrid uh, sent, um, sent a message saying, no question, but an interesting and challenging history mentioning, you know, aneurysm, sleep apnea, um, absence epilepsy. And so all these different kind of conditions. And I was wondering, like, how do you identify the difference between them in imaging and are they connected to each other? Like can MS make you more likely to have a stroke or something like that? How are they connected, if at all? Okay, so there are different tests and different imaging techniques that will be able to tell uh, if you have MS, if you have a stroke. And for things like Alzheimer, that's a bit more tricky. Um, those are usually post mortem um, uh, analysis that will tell you more about that, um, but MS is, can be diagnosed. Um, I think uh, there is, um, I think that's especially uh, if it happens in uh, one person with multiple conditions, I will, I'll, I will tend to, to think that there is some genetic components um, that can play a role here. Um, I think there is a, a case report um, of patient having multiple sclerosis and um, that was correlated with the occurrence of uh, aneurysm rupture. Mm. Um, but again, I think it has to do with some genetics um, components that play a key role, as I mentioned, in cerebrovascular health. Mm. Um, 
I, I, there was another part to your question, I think. I, I, no, it was a very complicated okay. question. I think you covered it off. Yeah. Um, and I think you also just answered Dorothy's question because um, she has just asked if stroke is a genetic condition. Um, and it, it can be, is that? There is, a, there is there can be uh, a genetic component yeah okay great um and so uh, and the next question is from an anonymous attendee um and they've asked if retinal vein occlusions um are similar to a stroke um or are they a precursor to stroke um or are they complete some, something completely separate well, if you think that stroke is defined as an obstruction in in an artery uh, that you know leads to um, a shortage of blood to a specific brain region, that's very uh, similar to what happens to a retinal occlusion, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the it, it it is a the visual um, the visual field. It's a, it's something a tiny bit, um, something a tiny bit more complex, um, mm -hmm. and it has eyes are um, represents a lot of the characteristics that you know if you think in terms of connect connections of blood vessels and supplying different parts of the of the eye, um, it is something that it's a tiny bit outside of my. Um, field of study uh but definitely those are um so i'm not 100 percent sure about the correlation between having some uh retinal occlusion and um occlusion if there is any correlation uh, mm. with the occurrence of a stroke so i'm not 100 percent sure about that yeah okay yeah no i thought that when i was thinking retinal i was like oh i don't know if this is but thank you anyway for that answer okay. um so we have um, a another answer here, a question here from Anonymous again, um, asking what the difference between a stroke and a brain aneurysm is. Because I think I, I often hear personally it's used inter interchangeably a lot, but they are different, aren't they? So an aneurysm is a subtype of, of stroke, mm. basically. It's a type of stroke. You can distinguish as a stroke is an occlusion, it's shortage of blood to a brain area. And that can be uh, in the form of ischemia, which is a clot in a blood vessel, or an aneurysm, which is the rupture of a vessel. Mm -hmm. They both lead to a reduction in blood flow in a specific area. But they are, an aneurysm is a subtype of stroke. Mm -hmm. Um, but the aneurysm, if it if it's not ruptured yet, if it's just like intact, the um, it, it, then then it's kind of yeah. It, is that so still the rupture of the rupture of an aneurysm leads to a uh, an hemorrhage, a okay. blood hemorrhage, right? Uh, but there is still uh, like um, an a, 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 a site uh, where blood i mean it, it basically forms like a it's still a point where there is no flow mm -hmm. okay yeah that makes sense um and then we have a question next we have a question from sarah asking if a person adopts a healthy lifestyle um could they possibly reverse the atherosclerotic plaques which might have formed in an unhealthy lifestyle, like let's say you're drinking and smoking and then you turn your life around and um, adopt all these healthy habits, can you reverse the damage possibly? So um, this is a tricky one. Mm. It definitely it definitely helps. Uh, it depends on the, on the stage of the atherosclerotic plaques that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Lifestyle alone, May, I mean, maybe combined with the therapy, medicine thera therapy, uh, you can definitely have positive effects, uh, but it depends on which stage we're, we're talking about. Mm. I cannot give you a definite answer because that would need to have, you need to have an assessment of um, mm -hmm. the state we are, you are at. Mm. 
but it definitely it definitely helps mm. I mean I guess it's always going to be like beneficial to make those lifestyle changes regardless of you know what stage you're at or anything absolutely. it's always yeah it's never going absolutely. to be detrimental <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay. And then another one about risk factors here. Um, Andy has, uh, said that they usually take a hundred milligrams of caffeine every morning. Um, and they've asked how will this affect their cerebrovascular health? Is uh, there a link between caffeine and? I'm not sure about any research on caffeine specifically, okay. at least I'm not aware of. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Great. It's definitely a stimulator. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know, I'm not a coffee drinker, so I don't know how much a hundred milligram of caffeine will. I think a hundred milligrams is about a cup of coffee, I think, from memory. Okay. Um, I could be wrong, but. I I would say that excess is the problem. I, mm. I'm not sure a cup of coffee can be defined as something that is excessive drinking. Um, but yeah. Um, I'm not 100% sure about how that would be affecting your cerebrovascular health. Again, the healthy lifestyle is the key, but I don't see a cup of coffee as an excess. Okay, great. That's um, that's good then. Um, and next question, um, we have um, from Anonymous is asking about your research. Um, the stimulation that you're talking about, is it electrical or sensory stimulation? We do both. We do oh, both. both. In the, yeah, we do both in, in, uh, in my lab. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we are trying to, uh, as I mentioned before, we're trying to find the translatable forms of uh, stimulation. Uh, mm -hmm. Sensory, um, it's something that it's a new, it's a new avenue. Um, electrical stimulation is something that uh, we are exploring it is um it is done in uh, stroke patients already but we what we are targeting the, the key of what we are doing is really to explore uh, frequency specific types of uh, stimulation and we are trying to adapt the kind of stimulations that we are doing um we try to target it to ongoing brain activity so that each individual will get a specific type of treatment. Mm -hmm. We are trying to, we're really trying to get to the point where we will have individualized forms of stimulation. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of having what is commonly done as this uh, one size fits all kind of approach, we're really trying to uh, understand how brain activity of each individual can be affected by a stroke and how our intervention can be modulated according to the need of a, of a specific uh, person. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, it's it, Personalized treatments are such an exciting um, area in, yeah, in neuro, neurological research in general. Um, but yeah, that's great to hear. Um, we have... A question here um, about sleep um, saying you mentioned that sleep is neuroprotective um, are there any other options um, that are available to assist those who have non-modifiable risks present so if someone has like a bunch of non-modifiable risk factors will it still be like worth improving the sleep um, like I guess yeah absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. especially especially for people that have non-modifiable uh, risk factors, try to, and as I mentioned before, unfortunately, there is not much you can do for those factors, but try to improve the rest. Try to help um, yourself with sleeping, health lifestyle. It's, it's still something extremely important. Blood pressure is something very, very important. Mm. Okay. Um, that's that's good then. Um, so all of those other lifestyle and factors and behaviors, um, if anyone's worried about their non-modifiable risk factors, um, yeah, that's great to know that you can still engage in all of those other um, habits and yeah. Um, we, I have another question here from um, Miriam um, and 
Uh, this is, I guess, more of a personal question. Um, she's actually mentioned that she has she had had a stroke and um, her left side is affected. Um, and while we can't, I guess, answer for her specific situation because obviously you're not her doctor. Um, but in general, um, if someone loses like motor function in one side of their body after a stroke, is there anything that can be done with rehabilitation or possibly with your research with the the electrical or sensory stimulation? So in terms of rehabilitation, this is something that it, it, it has been shown, um, it, it has it has improved a lot motor function. So this is something that you, you need to, it, it may be hard at the very beginning, but mm -hmm. please continue physical rehabilitation. Obviously, try to talk. You could, I mean, my research specifically, we're not there yet where we where it can be tested in uh, in in humans, but there are uh, forms of stimulation that can um, that can be used. But you need to talk to your doctor, and uh, you you need to ask what is available uh, in your in your area uh, at your hospital. Mm, okay. Um, that's, that's great. Thank you. Um, and then we have, um, uh, Lolita has, um, have followed up actually on the sleep that we were talking about earlier. Um, and she's said, um, in terms of sleep assisting with bioproducts, sorry, I'm trying to, um, getting rid of, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, bioproducts. <laughs> Um, what was the other benefit? Um, she's mentioned replenishing extracellular fluid. Can you please elaborate a bit on what that actually means? Yeah, absolutely. So um, it's it's exactly what you mentioned, uh, extracellular fluid and uh, clearing of the brain is, is a process that naturally occur when we sleep. Mm -hmm. And it's like getting rid of all waste that we accumulate in the brain. And recent findings, uh, re recent studies have shown that this can be on the long run malfunctioning of clearing, waste clearing from our brain, brain can lead to neurodegeneration. Imagine like um, your brain being, being full of waste products that mm. accelerates things like uh, plaques formations and um, uh, amyloid even. So there is very interesting, there are very interesting studies on Alzheimer's disease and the effects of lymphatic clearance in uh, in the brain and the effect that that has on uh, pathologies like Alzheimer's. So okay. it's, it's, this is the key. Mm -hmm. I, I, yeah. yeah. No, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, and now a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, I have one here from um, Patrick has mentioned a couple of times um, that um, he has a disease called catacil, which I believe is a type of cerebrovascular, no, small it's vessel. It's a small disease. vessel disease. Yeah. Yes. Um, very, it's a very dear form of disease to me because I did my PhD on Cadazil and Carazil. One uh, is the dominant, is a dominant type of um, small vessel disease. And the Carazil is the recessive form. They are both genetic forms of uh, small vessel diseases. Uh, um, it definitely... The, it definitely needs uh, greater recognition. Uh, mm. I, I I totally agree with you. It may be misdiagnosis. Misdiagnosis ah. MS. Exactly, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, there are, um, I mean, also in this case, it's very important that um, you talk to, the neurologist about um, specific tests that can be uh, used to, to 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 distinguish an imaging brain imaging, uh, but you are right that um, it can be misdiagnosed with MS, mm. um, and I I unfortunately cannot really comment on. 
um, on, on that much more than, than saying that there is a lot of research that we are trying to conduct specifically on these rare forms of uh, small vessel diseases. Yeah, of course. Um, no, thank you. I understand that you can't yeah, give any like specific advice, but um, but uh, that's really interesting to hear that that was um, part of your thesis. Um, and another question here in the last few minutes. Um, uh, what have we got here? Sorry, I'm just going through the <laughs> through the Q and A here. Um, yeah, and if I can add something while you find another uh, question, because I'm reading yes. public um, follow up. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, there are no other. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a genetic form. Uh, it's a genetic form. The for uh, and lincaras, if it, it, it's a genetic component. Um, those are genes. Um, alteration in certain genes that cause um, that cause the disease. So that's mm -hmm. that, that's why. Oh right, okay. his follow up question. Yeah, mm -hmm. great. Um, thank you. Um, and I guess um to wrap up, um, I've seen a few questions come through that have mentioned um migraine and stroke risk. Um, and I've heard a couple of things about this in the past. Do you know anything about um the relation here or yeah, I guess if there is a connection between migraine and stroke. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of research uh, trying to uh, to find correlation between migraine and certain kind of migraines um, with uh, with stroke. So there is there is a lot uh, of research ongoing at the moment. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, great. Um, and. Uh, I guess, is there anything else that you wanted to um, to touch on or talk about just in the last couple of minutes here? Um, anything that you feel like we haven't talked about yet in the Q&A time that you wanted to address? Uh, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, I, I think I did mention that maybe something that did not come up in the in the questions, uh, but I did mention during the presentation is the uh, effects of sex. Um, so how stroke can affect men and women differently mm. um, with obviously uh, women being less affected during the uh, before menopause because of some hormones that are um, that are uh, protective, estrogens are protective, but then after menopause the, that's more or less the same sort of um, it's more or less the same than the male after. Uh, and that's something that did not come up during the questions, but it's something I think very interesting. Sex differences is something very, yeah, very interesting that uh, I think your research needs to be explored more. Um, yeah, this is something that, yeah, maybe yeah. would be interesting for, for people to hear. Uh, yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah. We actually, um, sorry to keep going, but um, we okay. actually talked about this as well in Monday's webinar about dementia risk factors and um, Karen um, mentioned that um, it's similar with dementia how the drop in estrogen can also like increase risk of dementia um, and she mentioned that like possibly something to do with HRT I guess um, like being studied to see if that would help reduce people's risk of dementia is there any similar research happening with stroke? Um, I am not aware of, uh, mm -hmm. of it, but it's definitely something interesting to explore. And as I mentioned, there is there needs to be done much more on on that field. And uh, it's 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 really interesting uh, to to hear that for other uh, conditions is the same, and uh, then highlights the importance of um, uncovering more in that space. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, hopefully all of the research can kind of, I guess, like Merch help together. inform yeah. each other. And Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Um, well, thank you so much for your time, Mathilde. Um, it was really great. And I think we had a really fun, um, interesting and um, I learned a lot during this Q&A. Um, so I hope everyone else feels the same. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for being part of Brain Awareness Week. Um, Thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, hope you enjoy the rest of your week.